Gentlemen, um, I'm ever so pleased that so many of you have uh, actually taken your feet and uh, found your seat in this particular room and um, I think our high level panel is uh, ready to rock and roll and answer your questions. But first of all, let me remind you what you've come to listen to. Um, we're talking about connectivity and uh, the fine people organizing uh, this conference have then put almost journalistic questions. Where, why, when and how. Uh, now, me being a journalist, uh, I always say, you know, as a journalist you learn first of all who. And uh, we will have uh, six fantastic speakers who will uh, stand for the who uh, exactly just as much as you are because you're the executive organs of whatever mobility policy is carried out in your country and uh, in whichever position you are sitting. Um, the question what is uh, quite easily answers, that is the question of connectivity. Um, and all the rest um, is quite easy to be answered. Well, I have read some of the answers already, uh, so I've got a sort of strategic advantage. The only question that none of them have answered, and it's one of the questions that I'm quite sure that many of you have in the back of your minds, is how much? So we all want connectivity. We know that's the biggest challenge, or one of the biggest challenges in, in uh, uh, this century. Mr. Klasecker will actually start uh, his speech later on by pointing out how many people are living in urban areas in the future. Well, let me just uh, point out to the fact that last year we had a turning point. Last year, it was the first time that more people were living in cities and megacities in this world than in urban areas. Of course, to anybody, talking about mobility, facilitating and uh, making mobility more effective, that must be a big challenge, especially in such a big state as Australia, for example. Now, of course, the challenges um, in the north and the south may differ a tiny bit. But I can assure you, having been at a, another Mobility Congress uh, in December last year, that Joburg, that uh, Mexico City, uh, that Bogota, that other places around this globe are facing the same challenges and are looking for the same answers. I'm very much looking forward uh, to what our panel will uh, tell us uh, in a moment. Uh, let me just quickly share with you how we intend to run it. Uh, we've asked each and every one to give a five minute intervention except for our first speaker. And our first speaker has actually just got a big award um, saying that uh, his engagement in uh, seamless transport um, has been not only recognized but also uh, been assisted by this big plaque he's now going to sort of carry around and uh, he's sitting in front of me, Peter Handy, he's the Commissioner Transport for London of course of the UK. Now ladies and gentlemen, I happen to sort of live in two places at the same time and um, thanks to Mr. Mr. Handy's work and all his stuff, I can actually manage from my desk in Cologne to reach my desk in London, which means that I'm working a lot, maybe too much, but I can actually do it in three and a half hours, ideally. I've done it once out of maybe 50 trips. So connectivity does work. If it works, it's absolutely fabulous and fantastic. And how you actually manage working connectivity in a place like London. Peter Handy will share with us in a moment. Also, this year, as everybody here in this room knows, uh, is a time of a big challenge uh, for London. And um, sorry, Mr. Handy, I'm planning not to be there at the time. Uh, we're going to have the Olympics in London. And of course, uh, it is much better to watch it at the television screens than actually be there. OK, the several million tourists will not listen to me. Mr. Handy, we will listen to you now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, let's put that there. It's good to be here. Um, uh, thank you for that introduction. Uh, you may not come to London for the Olympics, but I think lots of other people will, uh, and I'm working hard on it. Um, today is an important day for uh, my city uh, because um, the city is voting for its next mayor. It's important to me, uh, but actually uh, it's a good day to come to Leipzig uh, to avoid the election. Um, whoever London elects, one thing won't change. Um, transport is about 
uh, is not about transport itself. Nobody's interested in transport uh, in its own regard, except for enthusiasts. It's about economic growth. Con connectivity and transport are about economic growth. And with London at the heart of the UK economy, the need for continued investment in transport in, in, in our city is now broadly accepted by policymakers. It wasn't always this easy. Uh, we didn't have a strategic authority for London for 15 years. Um, and in that period of time, it was very difficult to uh, find sufficient resource to keep the system, uh, transport systems going. Uh, we did just enough and sometimes not enough to ensure the transport networks uh, survived and the city uh, kept going. But there was no clear leadership, no single champion to make the case for transport investment, um, nor to ensure that transport services and infrastructure were joined up and integrated. And it was business in our city who demanded a, a strategic mayor in order to uh, redress that, that balance. The establishment of the mayor and my authority, Transport for London, paved the way for a shift in mentality um, about the economic development of the city and to meet not just today's challenges but tomorrow's as well, thinking 5, 10 or even 30 years ahead uh, with options for new links, new technologies and a fully integrated approach. The benefits of this approach are considerable, in fact uh, they're essential. We're in a un unique position to provide strategic direction for the transport of a world city with a holistic approach that understands the needs and interactions of different modes. The Mayor's transport strategy, which sets out a comprehensive long-term transport vision alongside the London Plan, which is the Mayor's strategy on economic development and land use, are essential documents in delivering um, the economy uh, uh, of our city in the next 20 years or so. It also means a more harmonised interface for Londoners to deal with, whether individuals seek travel information or companies seek travel planning support. It's especially important to us because London is a growing city. People want to live in London, they see it as it's always been a place of opportunity, and over the course of the next 20 years, London will need to accommodate 1.3 million more people, and whoever wins today's election will want to meet these... Uh, uh, will want to... Uh, meet this challenging uh, uh, growth in the most sustainable manner possible. Restraining growth is, isn't an option. Creating jobs and having an economy to cope with the people who are going to come whether we like it or not is absolutely essential. And that's why we're investing in London's, London's transport. It's essential for working Londoners, more than half of whom rely on public transport to get to work, rising to nearly 80% for those working in central London, but it also benefits the rest of the country. I'll say more about modernising the metro and building um, a new cross London railway link in a moment, but together those projects add nearly £80 billion to the UK's wealth, additional revenue for our Treasury, and our investment in London's transport supports 25,000 jobs across the UK and a number overseas. London is, of course, the engine of the UK economy and a successful international business centre, adding 70% more wealth to the national economy than any other region, and we're also a net exporter of tax, as the Mayor keeps reminding um, the government. And that's the point. As Europe and much of the Western world, in fact much of the world, struggles with austerity and the financial climate, one of the most effective ways to aid recovery is by investing in cities and their wider transport connections. Efe efficient and effective connectivity is required at all levels, at international, national, interregional, citywide and local. Adequate air airport capacity, high-speed rail linkages are all important. But actually, above all that, actually, now that the majority of the world's population lives in cities, the efficient and properly planned management of mass urban transport is absolutely critical to uh, ensuring the social, economic and well-being uh, survival of those cities and actually enabling economic growth where it can take place most easily. We've improved access to key transport nodes, we've improved services in various modes in London in order, not only radial routes but orbital routes, to avoid central, uh, the, the centre of the city in order to make, uh, make growth happen. Um, and I would say, since I have the opportunity of saying it, and in another part of Europe, that in Europe at least there's one institution uniquely placed to help, the European Commission. Although it has its own funding constraints, and that's unlikely to change in the new seven-year budget from 2014, there is at least the potential for a major reorientation towards jobs and growth. 
There has been a welcome move in this direction already, and the Euro European Commission should be applauded for that. But much more needs to be done if Europe is to pull out of its current economic malaise, and a major boost to transport investment, particularly in urban areas, together with projects aimed at energy efficiency and reductions in CO2, have the ability to really deliver the jobs and growth that every, na every nation talks about. It's a highly political debate. More money for cities and their transport systems means less for other categories and areas, but I think it, it's incontrovertible that the EU should invest in those areas which give greatest return. Given that the cities are the engines of economic growth and are home to the vast majority of citizens, the urban agenda has never been more important. There is, of course, a debate about subsidiarity, and that is important, but local decision-making and involvement in EU policies are not mutually exclusive, and if ever, if ever there was a time for cities to act and to be supported, it's now. So in London we're playing our part, fully engaging with EU institutions and with our city's population set to increase, we're working hard to plan for that growth with increased connectivity within London particularly, but with better connections elsewhere as well. We're building a new cross-London railway. I've been around for nearly 40 years in the transport industry and when I was a young man uh, a project called Crossrail was on the drawing board then. It's taken a very long time to get it to the stage at which the contracts have been let. Uh, I'm delighted to tell you, as a uh, veteran of uh, public sector transport management, that the contracts are let and it's too late to stop this project, which is highly desirable um, because actually it's going to make a huge difference to the city. It's one of the big biggest construction projects in Europe. When it opens in 2018, its scale will be no less impressive, adding 10% to our rail-based capacity and connecting Heathrow with the West End, the city and Canary Wharf, and creating jobs and job opportunities for some of the deprived communities in the east and southeast of, of London. The other thing that any, uh, uh, that any proprietor of an ageing uh, transport network in a world city will tell you is that it's not only new investment that's really important. I run two museums, one of which is very, uh, is very attractive for families and children in Covent Garden and has some immaculate exhibits. Uh, the other I, I, travel, uh, I have four million customers a day on. Some of it's nearly 150 years old, which we'll celebrate in January 2013. Uh, some of the trains are 50 years old. Some of the signalling uh, was, uh, was young when my father was young. And actually, we have to do something about that. It's a familiar story. It's not just London. It's New York and other world cities have ancient infrastructure in which it's all too easy when you're investing new money to forget to replace the old. We have a project now, after a lot of uh, hesitation, um, but a great deal of the government support, I have to say, we are now engaged in a modernisation of our, of our metro, which will not only bring it up to modern standards with air conditioning in some cases, but actually increase the capacity in a way that the city badly needs. I have stations that close in the mornings and the evenings. I have stations that close at weekends because they're too full of people and it would be dangerous if you didn't do that. And that really is an issue which needs to be confronted. What's next? Well, you look beyond this immediate horizon. You have to finish the work you've started. You have to finish modernising the systems that you've got. And then you have to define the schemes and policies needed to meet the next stage of growth um, to cope with the growing population of the city. We're doing that. We're looking at further potential for cross London rail links. We're looking at the accommodation of the extra passengers from the proposals for a new domestic high-speed rail line. Uh, and of course, more immediately, uh, as Connie mentioned, we have the little matter of the Olympic and Paralympic Games, uh, which are in 80 days or so, uh, and, uh, uh, and which occupy a bit of my time. It is a challenge. Uh, we've had £6.5 billion worth of investment since the bid was won six years ago. It's particularly a challenge because the uh, major stadium and many of the events are held within the inner city. But it's going to be a fabulous event, and it, and it, and it has a legacy not only of the investment, but a legacy, as you'll hear if you come to hear me speak this afternoon, in terms of persuading businesses to to manage their travel demand, and particularly in freight and logistics, in hoping to, ch to, to turn the tide in favour of delivering more goods and services in the evenings, at night and in the early mornings. 
The award that Connie referred to is about ticketing, is about oyster ticketing. And we're very proud of the fact that, one, that, that there are two things that people want from an integrated public transport network. One is integrated ticketing, so you don't have to worry which mode of transport you're on, which we have, and that's what the award was for, with our friends in the Association of Train Operating Companies and our contractor, Cubic. Um, the other is, uh, is information, where actually um, nobody cares who operates the service. What they want is inform multimodal information across the uh, entire range of services such that you can find your way uh, easily. Uh, what I'm proud of is that we have an integrated authority and therefore we've not only got the Oyster card, but we are able to do integrated information. And there's no doubt at all that the growth in the, in the use of our uh, transport systems in London is at least partially due to the fact that you can travel easily, you don't have to keep buying tickets, you don't have to remember whose network you're on, and also because the information is cross-modal um, without, without prejudice. And I think that that's one of the great achievements of any city which has a transport authority um, um, like ours. Um, I'm going to sh foreshorten this a bit because I think there are a number of other people to say and not, not, not uh, to speak and not enough time to say. But what I would say in conclusion is this. I think the establishment of a city-wide strategic uh, political uh, figure of some force like the mayor, of national presence like the mayor, is, is essential. I think the establishment of a city-wide transport authority able to influence the provision not only of public transport, but of the road network and have an influence on freight, freight logistics and people's choices of mode, including walking and cycling, is essential. I think it's essential for such a mayor to have a long-term vision of economic growth. I think a transport strategy that looks out over 20 years is essential. There is a challenge in all of that, which is when you've got all those things, to maintain the support from government, maintain the support from business who, who are interested in economic growth, maintain the support from wider stakeholders and the public for continued investment. And actually what you need as a consequence is to continually make the case for investment in, in, in connectivity. We're very lucky. It's business that's driven our investment programme, or at least the success of funding it. And I always say, wherever I speak throughout the world, that actually if you can't take business leaders with you, you're lost, because actually the users individually don't have much of a voice, but the people who are determined to make the city grow and expand actually do and can influence parts of government that transport professionals can only dream of. And for us in the Western world, we are competing with others. We're competing with China, we're competing with the Far East, we're competing with, with India. And actually, if you look what they're doing, they put, they're putting massive investment into urban transport in order to, uh, in order to grow their economies. And I think that's a, that, that, that's a really primary lesson, which is that you don't have to invent all this yourself. You look at what other people do, and they're doing it as, as well. The last thing I'd say is this. One of the things that we're very proud of is that our government and, and, and the mayor, actually both candidates for mayor, I should say, since there be, might, might be a new one by tomorrow evening, have also been very strident in saying that in a period of great economic difficulty, investment in connectivity is not is not only something that shouldn't suffer, but something that should be promoted. And that's really important, because you can argue that, that, that the public sector expenditure ought to be reduced, but surely not in areas where actually both you create jobs and you create wealth as a result of infrastructure investment, but the result is to make cities, again, the primary driver of economic growth in any world uh, e economy, um, to actually grow and to restore the economy to some health. I hope you've got the, visit, uh, the opportunity to come and visit us, if not during the Olympics, uh, then at some other time. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much. That was absolutely fascinating. And maybe, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen uh, from you also a little applause uh, for getting the award for the Oyster Card. Thank you. Thank you. I'd now love to uh, invite uh, my distinguished uh, panelists uh, to come and uh, join me. I would like uh, Mr. Klausiker to come uh, to my right hand. Uh, next uh, to him, uh, Mr. Kuroda. And last but not least, Mr. Albanese on my right side, um, which of course is your left side. It's always a question of perspectives. That's uh, very, very nice. Uh, uh, Mr. Ritzra, uh, please take that uh, seat. And Mr. Yakunin, it's wonderful uh, that you 
you are here with us and it must have rung a bell when you heard uh, about sort of ancient infrastructure because I believe Moscow's uh, metro system uh, has similar challenges. Listen, uh, to prep uh, just give uh, our um, sound engineer a chance, please. Okay. Listen, do you know, to keep transport system of the capital is already a nightmare. And to have, you know, Olympic Games at the same time, this is double nightmare. I know what I'm talking about. So. <laughs> of course. <laughs> so, so, so better he doesn't know about the nightmares to come and just sort of faces them afresh. <laughs> we, 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 don't, we, we admire you, but we don't want to be in your seat. <laughs> or, or like most of the population of London. Yeah. Uh, by the way, uh, since we are working uh, with translations um, uh, for some of the people who might not be speaking English, um, you'd always uh, need uh, your microphones if you want to talk. Let me turn uh, to Mr. Klaus Ecker uh, on my right hand. Uh, he's chairman of the management board of Bombardier Transportation here in Germany and uh, he's uh, a man who's accompanied uh, the industry from diverse sides. Uh, ten years in diverse uh, associations. Uh, both German and uh, European, um, and you've actually really sort of built trains. Well, you managed the building of trains uh, earlier in your career, and now you've gone back sort of uh, to the practical side. As I said, because I've had some insight uh, in uh, your speech or the uh, gist of what you wanted to say, uh, one of the important points is that urban uh, areas are growing, growing, growing. And I know that you've got some facts and figures with you, uh, what it's going to look like in 2050, or what the UN believes it's going to look like in the 2050s. Exactly. But it's 72, please. Yeah. But let me, let me start with... Uh with a, f a few impressions um, on, on connectivity and experience on connectivity. Wherever <clears throat> airports have been linked with high-speed rail, we have seen huge increase in passenger demand for rail. Um, and, and that to the benefit of all stakeholders, airlines, rail operators, operator of the, of the airports, <clears throat> and not least the passenger. Wherever high-speed rail has been well connected with regional rail, and metros, and where uh, rail stations outside uh, city centers have been well connected with buses, again, we have seen strong increase in passenger demand. So connectivity seems to be key to increase demand of passengers and to meet their particular demand, which is to answer the question, how do I get there? Now, now we come to the specific challenge of uh, that this global trend of urbanization brings to all of us. Uh, in fact, today we have a situation where more or less half of the global population live in urban centers and half of the population lives in rural areas. By 2050, we expect more than 70% of the global population to live in urban centers. And of course, their mobility will push demand for transport far beyond all existing capacities. And, uh, and I think we all need to find answers to this, uh, to this growth in demand for mobility. And, and at the same time, while population grows, mobility demand grows, resources don't. We won't find more space inside cities. Now certainly rail can give answers to these challenges. Uh, a metro requires 20 times less space to provide with the same transport capacity than, uh, than road. But to, in the end, we have to meet the passenger demand to gain, to win the passenger to use public transport. And there, again, connectivity is key. And I want to leave it at that point. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, you can see a smiling moderator because you were a bit shorter than uh, expected. Uh, absolutely brilliant. Um, uh, the next person to give us an input uh, is representing a country that is actually uh, holding the presidency of uh, this uh, International Transport Forum. Uh, Dr. Koyo Kuroda is the president of Japan Expressway International. Um, and if I learned correctly from you, uh, Professor Kuroda, um, you're actually representing five of six 
six of Japan's expressway operators. Now, um, all of us, uh, even those who do not uh, have close connections to transport, all know uh, that Japan has already found solutions uh, where other people were still sort of looking for solutions, that you've built these expressways and that they're working brilliantly. Now, there must be new challenges, uh, even in Japan. So would you please share some of the insight of where Japan is heading right at the moment? Yes, I have two slides to show, and uh, uh, as for my presentation, I would like to start from the highway sector, which I am from. Uh, if you see the right-hand side, uh, the figure, it shows the uh, uh, Haneda Tokyo Airport uh, that being connected by an expressway, it's a metro metropolitan expressway, and they have two interchanges. And that line goes under sea, and it is connected to the Aransa Expressway also. And if you see the table above the figure, uh, it says that 28 of, uh, major airports are in service within 30 minutes by expressway, uh, 25. And uh, for the 23 uh, major harbors, almost 21, 91%. And for the, our, what we are proud of is the Shinkansen, the bullet train, the future that 320 kilometers per hour, uh, are connected uh, by expressway. Uh, all of the, uh, their major stations are connected by expressway. So we can use that in a short time. And if you see the uh, left-hand side, uh, it's a map of the Tokyo subway route. And uh, it looks like a capillary, isn't it? Uh, capillary is a uh, uh, blood vessel. <laughs> uh, you know, the uh, importance is uh, not only the expressway system, how dense it is, but uh, the subway systems are connected by the outer uh, radial uh, private operated lines. So the, if you take the private line from a suburban area, which is directly connected to the subway, and it goes out of Tokyo in one line, uh, no transfer, you can do it. You know, so it is a seamless operation, uh, not only by the subway, but also the, uh, uh, the effort of uh, private uh, railway companies in Japan. So that's what I'm proud of. I'm uh, living in Tokyo. And the daytime operation in Tokyo is uh, about 12 million people. Daytime, so working there. At nighttime, they have only 8 million. So to serve for the, that, that 12 million, we need that kind of seamless uh, operation of trains, anyway. Uh, because we need to buy a house anyway. Uh, we lost everything after World War II, and we started from scratch. And we need a house, so living in the uh, suburb area, and commuting to the center of Tokyo. So to make this short, we need that kind of uh, seamless operations, of, uh, not only by private uh, railway uh, operators, but also the uh, subway system. And can I have the next slide? Thank you. Uh, the left-hand side uh, figure is uh, for Shibuya Station. Shibuya is a one town in Tokyo. And the line shows the uh, bus route operation of one bus company. But uh, in Shibuya, we have uh, seven bus operators. So I, I couldn't, I couldn't uh, overlap the uh, lines anyway. So uh, this bus route are uh, compromising, uh, not compromising, uh, together with uh, railways or subway system, uh, it covers very densely the area of Tokyo. And another story is the right-hand side figure. It's the uh, center of Osaka city. We call Umeda area. And if you see the color, uh, 
blue color is for the railway stations. And the violet color is uh, the building, but directly connected to the yellow part. That is the aisle and shop and restaurant and everything we have. So we have uh, two layers of town. So uh, we don't care about uh, living in underground, uh, shopping underground. It's okay to Japanese people. So we have set the two layers of town, and the connection is very good, actually. From one station to one station, you go, and you can grab a coffee and go for a walk. It's directly connected to the uh, aisles anyway. So that is a way of uh, Japanese connection, uh, seamless connection. Wet. So <laughs> this is one example anyway. But uh, the effort uh, for the uh, seamless uh, connection uh, we have done from the previous generation, not only recent time, but also just after World War II, we have nothing, and we started from scratch. And this is what we have now. Uh, this is matching uh, with the Japanese environment. Uh, we used to have uh, 16% GDP increase for 18 years. Not now, of course, but uh, we used to have that kind of uh, GDP growth. And uh, which is uh, egg or chicken, I don't know, but uh, we needed that kind of system to accommodate that kind of GDP increase. And uh, because of the population we have in Japan, uh, these kind of investments are well financially justifiable. And the uh, history of Japan says the uh, rail railway operators are all private. They started uh, the red train system, but by the private sector in the history of Japan. And uh, those lines that uh, you are seeing is all privately owned and privately operated. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, I would like to uh, sort of straight away get uh, the next input. Um, we have uh, just heard uh, Peter Hendy talk about uh, the Oyster Card and the new connection also to railway. Uh, the Netherlands have actually sort of taken uh, the concept to the top. I mean, um, if I was uh, if I was traveling in, in the Netherlands now, I would just have to have a little card. And I, I saw that you had it with you. And uh, could we just quickly see it? Uh, for most of you, of course, we don't have a camera in the room. Oh, yes, we do have a camera in the room. Uh, <laughs> um, it's just a tiny little chip card. And Shiba uh, Rietstra, I know that you've uh, been involved in changing uh, the Netherlands uh, mobility system, uh, that you were one of the masterminds behind that. So uh, you could uh, really be proud of it. Now you're uh, Secretary General of the Ministry of Infrastructure and the Environment. Um, how did you actually get everybody to agree to put their transport uh, um, bills into that one little card? Oh, um, I'm jealous uh, of my colleague in Japan. I'm jealous of my colleagues in Hong Kong, in Singapore, and even I'm jealous of my colleagues in London, because the first uh, time I visited uh, Hong Kong and Japan to look after a kind of uh, what we call in Dutch public uh, transport a chip card was in 1918. Eight, 12 years ago, 14 years ago. Yeah. And we started and we debated and we started again and we debated again because the question, will all the public transport com companies work together? But not only the public transport companies, but also the national government, regional government, municipalities, uh, mayors, uh, all together had to work together to come to one uh, public uh, uh, transport uh, card. It took a lot of time, it took a lot of debate, uh, it took a lot of money, uh, because uh, uh, I think three, four years ago, we had um, a so-called uh, hijacker <laughs> to, 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 to an attack on the, on the card. Is it safe? Well, is it, uh, will uh, there be a, 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 a crime case, a business case for criminality? It, it is not. But it gave a lot of debate. So in the Netherlands, the problem is, last year, it's on to introduce nationwide. When you come to Holland, land at Skip Home, buy one, and you can use all the public transport in the Netherlands. But at the same time, that's the, that's the second step. The first step was already in the Netherlands. One system, 
of public uh, transport information. And now, uh, I'll say that I think 10, 15 years ago. And the third step we are now doing, when you're visiting the Olympics in London, take a while, visit Holland, then you see all the major, yes, uh, cooperation between England and Holland can be good, uh, visit the major uh, trans, um, uh, train stations in the Netherlands, Amsterdam, Rotterdam, Utrecht, uh, The Hague. They are all building sites to make them multimodal hubs for national trains, regional trains, trams, metro, buses, and bicycles. I give an example. We built in Utrecht, as part of the new station, a parking place for bicycles, 30,000 places. So you arrive at Schiphol, you go by train to Utrecht, you use a bike, and visit all in the Netherlands. And all by bike? Yes, uh, <laughs> Dutchmen are bikers. <laughs> okay, that's that's a good way uh, to keep fit. Thank you so much uh, for this input at the moment. And I have a number of questions I would actually uh, like to throw to you, but I would like uh, to continue um, our round and introduce uh, uh, the the last two uh, honoured speakers. Um, I would like to turn to my right, uh, so and, um, uh, the Honourable Anthony Albanese, Minister for Infrastructure and Transport in Australia. And we just had uh, uh, a quick chat. You live in Sydney, well, work in Canberra, mostly on... Uh, on the road uh, internationally, uh, probably on a plane. Um, where are the particular uh, challenges as far as seamlessness um, and investment is concerned right at the moment in Australia? And when I say right at the moment, uh, the problems are here now, but this, the solution you will have to live with for the next 20 to 30 years. Thank you. Um, I think uh, the benefit of uh, coming to conferences such as this is you realise how common the challenges are and uh, the, the task is pretty simple. Um, I think in terms of addressing the how, the, the big challenge that I've found as uh, coming into uh, the Ministry of Infrastructure and Transport that I've had since 2007 is how do you break the nexus between the political cycle, which is three years in our country, four years in some, and the infrastructure investment cycle. How do infrastructure and transport advocates win the battle around their cabinet tables, often uh, with disagreements from finance ministers or treasury, uh, because inevitably investment in infrastructure is long term. So faced with those challenges, uh, such as uh, my government uh, will be going uh, back into surplus uh, when we hand down our budget next Tuesday, how do we make sure that infrastructure investment isn't cut, that that long-term productivity benefit is secured? What we did was uh, we established a, an independent statutory authority, uh, Infrastructure Australia, at arm's length of government involving the federal government, representatives of state governments and importantly uh, half of the board or, or council uh, made up of private sector representatives uh, including uh, Sir Rod Eddington is the chair who would be known to, Peter was the chair of uh, head of British Airways, uh, head of Cathay Pacific, well known international figure. Uh, on the board of News Corp, Rio Tinto, etc. So a, a, serious, a serious business figure. So that you mobilise uh, that support, going back to, the, to some of the comments that Peter made about London, about mobilising business support, I certainly agree with. How do you make sure that the political battle can be won? Uh, you need to have community support and business support and put it in perspective. What that board does is make recommendations to the government based upon uh, serious cost-benefit analysis. So you get the investment into the right projects. What it's also doing is looking at ways to make uh, microeconomic reform or regulatory changes to encourage private sector investment in so that you get the, the seamless uh, economic outcomes. Um, it's been pretty successful. Historically, in a country like Australia, 
the national government role in transport was aviation and shipping, but was essentially regional roads. We didn't engage in urban public transport, which is crazy. We're the most urbanised country on the planet. 80% of GDP comes from our cities. In spite of our image of the outback and kangaroos, we, uh, most people live in the big cities on the east coast in Perth. So we have, uh, for example, committed more to urban public transport since 2007 than in the previous 107 years of our federation combined in that short period of time by getting that analysis there. Secondly, also, it's enabled us to get away from the silo approach, I think, is critical. Uh, transport uh, often didn't talk to other, uh, other sections of planning because we have the three levels of government. So I think it's important that you have that integration there, that we plan. So as a condition of funding from the national government for state and territory governments, we've said you have to have in place capital city strategic plans so not just growth, because we have a lot of space, historically solution, just build more houses, keep cities spreading, don't worry about transport, employment, so you have all sorts of social in inequities within cities as well. So making sure that you have that, that integration in terms of planning is also essential. Uh, so we have developed an integration with a national port strategy, a national freight strategy. A, a classic case in my city of Sydney, is that you, you haven't had any dialogue even between the freight system and the passenger rail system. So you have passenger rail stopped while a freight train goes past. That sort of absurd mechanism. And because you have different levels of government, difficult to overcome. But I think the integration uh, is, uh, is critical. The other uh, and final point I'd make as well is that investing in connectivity I think uh, a new form of transport is communications. Uh, we are investing in a high-speed broadband network. That's about reducing urban congestion. One great thing is if we can create jobs and employment near where people live, change the way that the, the country operates so people don't have to travel as much, then you actually can make a difference on issues such as urban congestion whilst reducing emissions as well. So I think the whole concept of transport in 2012 is very different than it was uh, decades ago. Very, very fascinating. And coming from one uh, terribly big uh, continent, state, uh, um, I would like to come to another almost, uh, almost continent. Uh, <laughs> Almost, uh, uh, sort of, um, well, at least a 12 hours time difference uh, and uh, I think how many, how many time zones do you have uh, in Russia? 12. Well, well, fascinating. Um, Mr. Yakunin, would you just give me one second uh, to invite the gentlemen who are sitting uh, on the floor over there. Um, whilst we're talking up here, and I hope that's going to be the whole time, um, the uh, places in the first row are free. So if you want to take uh, a space here and sit more comfortably, uh, you're welcome. Um, so uh, just to compliment uh, our round, Vladimir Yakunin, as the president uh, of the Russian Railways, um, you've been uh, in that position for the last uh, seven years, if my mathematics are correct. Um, and um, before then, uh, you, you've had a number of jobs. You've been to the UN. Uh, you've been in uh, mobility um, as a minister um, for the last 12 years now. Where would you say is um, the, the, the most challenging aspect that you tackle every day and that gives you the most headache um, uh, and that you try to get away, uh, to get, try to get rid of um, at the moment in Russia. Okay. Uh, hello? Yeah. Um, our sound engineer is working on it. Um, since he can't see you, he doesn't know which microphone it is. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Managed. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much for your introduction. If I start to, to count the challenges of every day, I suppose I will consume the entire period <laughs> of these uh, sittings here, of the conference. Uh, because I'm responsible for the railways, uh, it is more comfortable to talk about railways, not about only the in-city or, you know, intermodal uh, transport systems. But of course, we are doing both. Just several examples. You know, 
Firstly, I should say that the transport market, railway transport market, is one of the biggest and uh, most growing, fastly growing market in the world. Just because of the necessity to develop the infrastructure of railways. My colleague from Japan, my colleague from Australia, you know, everyone is aware of this fact. And uh, so we should combine this global attitude together with more local, like city commu uh, communications, of course. And so far, we did not have any examples of intercity railway transport at all. We did not. We have, and we had and have, beautiful metro. But we never had, you know, on, on the ground, not underground, railway systems. And if Mr. Sabanin, who is the mayor of Moscow, uh, is sitting here, he would tell you that one of the most challenging uh, tasks for him, that this introduction of new transport system inside Moscow, and that is railway system. Because we have circle inside Moscow, a very big circle, and we have a plan to change it into you know, some special communication system for the uh, citizens of Moscow and, you know, visitors of Moscow. This is the first thing. But when I referred to London about the nightmare, nightmare of, you know, communications for the capital and uh, the communication for the Olympic Games, now we have both, but in different places. As I mentioned with Mr. Sabanin and Minister of Transport, we are talking and planning to introduce new railway system inside Moscow uh, with the perspective passenger flow of more than 2.5 million people per day. At the same time, we are an uh, essential part of the construction of the object for the Olympic Games of 2014. So we are doing both of the things. And um, speaking about the strong and weak points of Russian railways today, firstly, you know, of course, our strongest point is that we, the most experienced railway system in um, delivering f uh, cargo for the long distances. You know, from Ural, either to the west, either to the east, you have 5,000 kilometers, whatever. Our colleagues from coal mines in uh, Australia, they have 30 kilometers from the mine to the port. So this is already a great challenge. And the developing economy in Russia provided us with the figures that, for example, um, till 2015, we will increase the freight operation towards the uh, Pacific ports of Russia more than 2.5 times. And in some commodities, it will be 10 times bigger. We already overcome the period of integrated country of the Soviet Union in this uh, uh, capacity of the, of the cargo. And this is very essential, of course. On the other hand, you know, the passenger sector was, so to say, a little bit neglected because industrialization, necessity to deliver cargoes, everything like that. And, you know, the passenger sector was getting obsolete. Though in, uh, I guess, 1978, there were only two countries with high-speed trades, Japan with Shenkan Sen and the Soviet Union with Nevsky Express. So now we are to restore our experience in uh, high-speed train because that is essential to bring the distant parts of Russia closer to Moscow. Not physically, but timely. So that is the task we are now working on and already started from Moscow and St. Petersburg region. We are going to go to Siberia. We are going to go to Far East. And I would possibly finish with the fact that talking about transport, about communication, about where to invest, for what reason, the answers are obvious. But speaking about Russia, we should understand this is country, one part of which lies in Asia and the other in Europe. So this bridge 
the so-called land bridge connecting, you know, Far East and, you know, uh, you know, the Europe, for example, should go through this territory. And possibly in the nearest future, we will talk not about the communication system of London, not about the communication system of Japan or Tokyo or communication system of Moscow, but we will talk about integral uh, transportation service which provide the people and the owners of cargo, of course, the possibility to travel from Tokyo to Hamburg using the train, which start in Tokyo and finish in Hamburg or Berlin, whatever. I, I'm positive that will be done. And that is something new which we should observe, if my colleague, of course, agree with me. Thank you very much. I've just seen a sceptical look here on my right-hand side, uh, but maybe you talk about uh, that uh, railway connection in a moment. Uh, can I just have one quick, um, just to clarify um, uh, your statement. Um, do you do uh, that expansion at the expense of air travel, or do you say that there are two modes that um, are both important and are both being expanded? Listen, it is not possible to do something at the expense, for example, in Siberia, where you hardly can find any means of transportation, but the railways, for example. Of course, if we are speaking about the areas like St. Petersburg and Moscow, of course already, you know, the air fleet suffers, you know, the decrease of the passenger flow, like, you know, 10%. This is not critical, of course. But um, to my mind, for Russia, it is not that strong competition between the modes of transportation. Because, as I said, in some parts of Russia, you hardly can find any kind of transportation. That's why I'm saying that the development of transport market in Russia is the, you know, very inspiring possibility nowadays. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, for the clarification. Um, can I just um, throw uh, one particular question uh, at all of you? Um, there seems to be... Well, for now, outside of there seems to be a hen and egg problem. Like, do we have sort of integrated brick and mortar, i.e., the infrastructure first, and then we have brilliant IT systems, uh, connectivity systems, whether it's Oyster, Octopus, um, Your Card, whatever, um, with all the tail that's behind it. Um, now, what comes first? Do you have to have already sort of um, the underground station, the railway station, um, maybe the bus uh, um, uh, station outside, um, and then all the uh, office buildings on top? Is that number one? And then you have the IT system uh, coming over that? Uh, you're shaking your head, so please uh, contradict me straight away. Mr. Ritzler. Yes, I think we have no time to choose. It's both. Mm -hmm. To invest in infrastructure, to invest in stations, to invest in roads, to invest in waterways, to invest in uh, better ICT, better uh, uh, payment, system, payment systems, better uh, information systems. Mm -hmm. Because every day I think I had to wait. I uh, think of, of my three students, my ch three children, who wake up and want the information on their iPad. They okay. don't want to wait 20 years for new systems. Tomorrow, today, yesterday, mm -hmm. that's the question. Same in London? Uh, yes, I, I, I agree. I think that um, uh, it, it's essential to do both together because uh, uh, my colleague from the Netherlands is absolutely correct. Uh, the modern information technology um, it is is here now, and our customers and the people who live 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 in our cities demand this information. They demand this uh, interavailability now. But that's not the same answer as building infrastructures to cope with more demand, both within urban areas and between urban areas. Talking about uh, building infrastructure, um, Mr. Albanese first. Sorry. Uh, just simply, it, it is far more. Uh, it, it's cheaper to build in smart infrastructure as you're building it. On the, uh, at the same time and you can get much greater productivity. Part of what the agenda has to be isn't just new infrastructure, it's how do we get better results out of the infrastructure that we've got. 
Thank you so much. Um, Mr. Klasek, did I understand you correctly that you say as soon as um, you've enhanced connectivity, um, there will almost automatically be an increase uh, of passenger numbers, uh, which would then mean that you have to increase uh, connectivity again in order to have uh, uh, more passengers um, uh, at infinitum? I think that is mine. Hmm. Seventy-two. Mm, well, th that's obviously the case. I mean, good systems attract more passengers, better connectivity attracts more passengers, and more passengers again attract more passengers. Successful systems attract more passengers. That's obviously the case. But in fact, I mean, this is, and in particular for big cities, this is an, 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 an impact we wish to take place because this is to, we want to attract passengers to use public transport systems. To quote your first and word, growth. So we all, so we all put our bet on this, on this effect. And, uh, and, and, but I mean, I think we also should be, should be fair to say that, of course, financial resources to build additional, additional infrastructures are not unlimited. I think that's probably the largest constraint to everybody these days. Um, we've seen in London a big project uh, underway um, um, to, to exploit the existing infrastructure to a maximum by, by enhancing the, the traffic control systems. Yeah. And I think that's very often also an opportunity to make better use of existing infrastructure. And, and by putting up a uh, congestion charge, which uh, also limited uh, for a while the number of people coming into London, I suppose. Exactly. That's also a good, a good means to attract more people to public transport and at the same time make those that don't want to to use public transport pay for a total transport system that is better for everybody. Yeah. Mm. Um, thank you very much. I know, ladies and gentlemen, you're eager to put your questions, and I think we have half an hour left for a proper discussion. So I would uh, like to invite you all uh, to put your questions to us. And I know that I've got a first taker already in that area. Nope. Um, okay, there's a gentleman with white hair, there's a gentleman uh, in the second but last row, and uh, there are young ladies running around with microphones, and I have noticed you, sir. Thank you very much. So if you could please get up, um, give us uh, your name and uh, organization that you work for, and then put your question to us. Thank you. Yeah, I'm on it again, uh, Thorson from the International Pedestrian Federation. Um, uh, connectivity, I'm trying to connect uh, with all of you and um, I would say it should be seamless and uh, um, try. When we think about uh, buses, trains that during hours at least are half empty in many places, uh, um, try to prepare the transport for growth, do minor arrangements to solve the gap between walking and public transport. Thank you very much. Anybody wanting to take that, um, Peter? Uh, yes, I think um, you, you're, you're right in, the, um, in, in your approach to wonder whether or not we uh, have missed talking about that because we don't care about it, I guess. Uh, the answer is, uh, I'm sure we do care about it, um, and actually making walking pleasant and one of the uh, preferred transport methods, uh, certainly in urban areas with relatively short distances, is actually a primary uh, requirement and does require some investment. Um, and the only reason that I think most of us don't talk about it is because the size and the scale of the, of the money that needs to be spent both in general urban connectivity and in interurban connectivity outweighs it. But that's not to say that walking and indeed cycling aren't important, because they are. Uh, and you may know that in London we've expended a, a reasonable amount of money in helping people find where they have to go, uh, in level crossings of roads, uh, in, in ways that encourage people to walk. And it is important, not only for, only for transport reasons, but for health reasons as well. Thank you so much, Professor Kuroda. 72 again. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, we think that uh, uh, walking for the commuting is very important for our health. 
No? So we enjoy working, actually. But to do that, we need some kind of uh, transit development. Uh, we talk about the horizontal accessibility, but we should also talk about the vertical accessibility for the pedestrians. And after the 2001 of uh, establishment of law for the normalization, you know, for the people, handicapped or elderly people, we are focusing on that. And also the pedestrian is all our, also they are a very important traveler. Uh, yes. Thank you very much. Anybody uh, wanting to get on the pe pedestrian train? <laughs> uh, not at the moment. So uh, the gentleman with the white hair, could you please uh, talk to us? Uh, thank you. Tony May, uh, World Conference for Transport Research. I wanted to come back to where Peter Hendy started, uh, which was the importance in 2000 of establishing a strategic government for London and a mayor responsible for that. Um, what I think one can think of as seamless governance, and Minister Albanese referred to the importance of this in Australia as well, but the vast majority of cities, all other cities in the UK and a majority in Europe, do not have such seamless governance. So I had a question really for Peter Hendy to start with, but perhaps for the rest of the panel as well. Is seamless governance essential in achieving the performance which a city like London is? Um, if not, how else can other cities emulate that performance? Thank you very much uh, for that very important question. Peter, will you do the kickoff? So, so, so I, it, it, it is a good question. I think, I think the establishment of strategic governance for uh, major urban areas is extremely important, and I think that the uh, that the economic development of London, since it's had uh, uh, an economic development champion in the mayor, has been testimony to how important that is. Of course, you'll, you'll know, uh, uh, as well as I do, that the, uh, uh, the UK doesn't have a good history of regional government. As my predecessor, Kylie, said, we haven't had a good revolution for over 400 years, so there's been no challenge to the national government by uh, by a... Um, uh, by an, uh, an urban area um, uh, uh, in the way that uh, many European countries have had. And I'm not sure it is correct to characterise much of the rest of the world cities as not having effective governance. Um, it does depend on the circumstances. Curiously, in Paris, my opposite number is a national appointment but funded regionally, whereas actually I'm a regional appointment funded nationally. But I think you can see around the rest of the developed world, movements towards stronger self-governance in cities, precisely because economic people come to cities for economic development, and that's the purpose. And certainly um, in, in, in the developing countries, there's huge pressure in places like Mumbai, for example, to get better city governance in order to more satisfactorily exploit the, the people in the city and the city for economic growth purposes. Thank you very much. Uh yeah, look, I certainly think that governance issues can be, can be critical. From my perspective, to give an example, Sydney has 46 separate local government areas. Uh, it is absurd. It means that each of those local government areas can't do any major uh, projects in terms of infrastructure. Compared with Queensland, which somewhat controversially, uh, the northern state of uh, uh, Australia, uh, has larger councils, including Brisbane City Council, is a million people. Um, we partnered with them to build a major road project at the moment, uh, along with uh, the private sector, a PPP, on uh, the Gold Coast in Queensland. We're partnering with them, first ever Commonwealth investment in light rail, and uh, we're partnering with uh, a northern uh, council uh, to build a a heavy rail project as well. We can't do that in states where you don't have the size and capacity of local government. What it also enables you to do is to get the better planning outcomes because you don't have the parochialness of being concerned, for example, about urban consolidation it has to be one of the things that we do in our cities, which is related to the pedestrian question as well. We need to, to build up uh, the uh, housing uh, supply and density around transport uh, links and corridors. Um, you can't do that if you have a little council saying, no, 
to development uh, all the time. So I think the larger scale brings in a, a better capacity for better governance. Even if there is not one such person, um, as we as we've seen in Peter Handy, um, how do you get um, a, an understanding between the different aspects of government that are uh, concerned? It's not just transport. Uh, it's it's um, many many different areas of diverse ministries are concerned in order to have effective planning and therefore effective uh, infrastructure. So how do you do that? Um, or how do you attempt to do it? We attempt to do it. <laughs> Seamless government is an everyday attempt. But I think in the Netherlands we have three types of answer. The first is since uh, one and a half year, there is a new ministry, infrastructure and environment. The combination of spatial planning, mobility, environmental planning and water management. So except nature, uh, nature and housing, all the physical aspects are combined in one ministry. Second, uh, we have a long sophisticated uh, experience in uh, spatial planning and mobility planning. Every five, ten years, uh, there is brought out a plan as a result of deliberation between uh, municipalities, provinces and the national government and uh, spatial planning and mobility planning for 30 or 40 years. That's the second. And the third is, we have an uh, investment planning program, pro, program for about uh, 20 years. There is budget till 2028, and we can make plans till 2028. And it's not only a question of, a question of seamless government, but one of the biggest problems is the participation of citizens. Are they accept the planning, the infrastructure, the stations, because it's ask a lot of noise problems for citizens and that is the second or the fourth seamless connectivity do you, do you relate to to this um, kind of process uh, mr yakunin um, even stronger with your permission if you are talking not only about the governance of the cities that big as london for example or tokyo but if you are talking about the planning uh, in the country I should state that it is extremely essential that the government should be involved. Because it is essential not only to think what is good for pedestrians or what is good for you know, passengers of railways, but it is extremely essential to know where actually one government should invest. Because you take uh, you know, any country, any continent, infrastructure of railways, cannot be invested by private capital. Everywhere it is, you know, public funds to be invested. And this is essential. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in former Soviet Union, no one enterprise could be started without the convention of the part of the railways that the railways can carry cargo into and out of the plant. You know, overwhelmed with the theory of liberal economists, that, you know, market will settle everything by itself. You know, for many years, we forgot about that. Now, we are paying back for that. So now it is essential to plan. And we have plan of the development of Russian railways till 2030 already. And that is the answer for this question. Extremely essential and very important role on the part of the government, on the part of the city government, to plan and to coordinate. Thank you very much. Mr. Kuroda, you would uh, like to add something at this uh, stage? Uh, in 1998, uh, 14 years ago, the government set up the uh, five years plan, uh, which is a uh, grand design for the 21st century. And important is uh, after that, two ministries are combined into one. But was, uh, those were MOT and MOC. MOT is in charge of transport, of course, airplane, uh, uh, sea, sea uh, transport. And, and the MOC was uh, responsible for the highway sectors. Then uh, that grand design was focused on the uh, connectivity and the coordination among the ministries. Then it is realized in Japan the, that kind of book, uh, that's my private idea as well. <laughs> Maybe ministry people to say no, but uh, you know, after that uh, we propelled 
uh, the movement uh, to discuss further together with people, uh, like a public uh, hearing, and we set up many committees uh, inviting professors and uh, NGO, NPO, and uh, it makes the whole uh, one effort. That was uh, Japan's experience. Thank you very much uh, for sharing that. And, uh, sir, thank you very much for that great question. I have an intervention uh, by Richard Abel. And uh, could you please uh, get the microphone? Oh, you already have it. <laughs> Good. Uh, thanks very much. Um, I just wanted to pick up on this tension between the long-term nature of many of the investments needed to uh, connect better um, our uh, infrastructure in transport networks and the short-term economic and political pressures that governments and public authorities face. Um, in Macquarie um, Infrastructure Funds, where I work, we have about 100 different companies in which we've invested globally. One of the things we sort of have observed there is something that can work quite well, both for private investors who are looking for the sort of future security of the cash flows that are going to pay back their investment and give them a reasonable return, and also public authorities, particularly finance ministries, who are looking to cap the liabilities of public subsidy or public expenditure that they might face, is to have a, quite a clear balance sheet for the relevant infrastructure network or asset, where long-term capital expenditure, shorter-term capital expenditure, operating expenditure, financing costs are, are quite clear and transparent and what income is coming in through fares and what income is and other user fees and what income is coming in from public subsidy is also apparent so that the trade-offs can be made and where times are tougher in uh, government often there's a pressure on that longer term capital investment um, in favour of operating expenses, which is something that you know you need to we need to try and resist for reasons of intergenerational equity and to avoid the situation building up over many decades that Peter referred to earlier, where we have these aging assets that hinder the sort of connectivity that we're looking for. And I'd be interested in uh, members' you know comments and experience of what sort of frameworks work for investment by private and public sector sources in transport networks. Thank, Thank you. you very much. I think uh, Anthony would be answering second um, after Michael. Same microphone. Why do we well, have... from our point of view as a, as a supply industry, the dilemma is even worse. It's not only the dilemma between the political cycle of three or four years and the investment cycle. It's the dilemma is worse because budgets are being set up year by year. And if you consider the investment cycle for a railway line, um, of course, that is a, a big issue. Now, uh, a new experience we are collecting here in Germany is the experience with a multi-annual contract where the government um, went into an obligation for five years to fund uh, railway infrastructure maintenance and, and modernization for a period of five years with a certain amount of budget. And that has, that has uh, enabled Deutsche Bahn um, to plan their works over a longer period of time, um, to plan traffic schedule over a longer period of time, and also for us as an industry, uh, they, could, they could clearly tell us what projects they intended to do over which period of time, and it, helped, uh, and it has helped uh, also the industry to, you know, to align uh, our capacities and resources over a longer period of time. I think that was to the benefit of everybody. Um, at the same time, I have to admit, also prices came down a lot because the former budget cycle uh, led to a situation where three quarters of the work usually we did in the last quarter of the year, and, uh, and, <laughs> and, uh, and it's, you may laugh about it, but that, that was just reality. And, uh, and uh, now, all, now, today, all these railway works can be done and planned and well executed over the entire year. Anthony, you mentioned uh, public-private partnerships as uh, one solution. Um, I believe that you must be predestined to answer that question. Well, with, with Macquarie, of course, one of our success stories, our export industries. Um, we, uh, I, I think the key uh, to, to the answer is really in the question, which is transparency and balancing risk, getting it right. Uh, where there have been public-private partnerships that have gone 
uh, not so good is where you've had uh, overexcitement in patronage forecasting in order to bid through the process. So people, private sector bids, um, have, uh, ha have lost money uh, because they've invested in roads expecting 10 million cars and they've got 3 million cars through, so hence haven't got the return uh, on their investment. What isn't understood by the general public is that that actually is a good outcome for taxpayers uh, in, in Australia. Where it's been a bad outcome, though, is confidence in investment in private infrastructure. So I think it's a matter of making sure that we get uh, forecasting, patronage risk, those issues got right and transparent. Done right, uh, we can get uh, investment in infrastructure through there's a range of methods. One is availability payments. So a private funding occurs for an a piece of infrastructure. The government guarantees a return over a period of time on the asset over 20 years. What that makes sense is the, the spreading of the benefit of that asset being there uh, is, uh, is properly done. Uh, rather than sort of intergenerational. It's almost a, a similar argument to the climate change argument in terms of intergenerational proper pricing. And uh, when it comes to infrastructure, um, I think that is the key, is that transparency and getting the details uh, right. I've already seen a number of people looking at their watches. Uh, gentlemen and ladies, um, I, I'm uh, tending to go on for another 10 minutes simply because we started 10 minutes late and I think the discussion uh, deserves uh, to be carried to the end. Uh, I think both of you would like to comment, so uh, maybe Siva, you start off and then Vladimir continues. I am not so negative or about the political process because in the Netherlands we have an investment fund, I told before, for 30 years. Second, we started a lot of DBFM contracts and we guarantee the private sector the returns. Uh, and third, I've never in experienced in 20 years working in a ministry that a an, an project which is started is stopped. And even in this budget crisis, the Dutch government is even more investing uh, than four or five years ago mm -hmm. in infrastructure. Thank you very much, Vladimir. This is extremely important question and very correct question. Because I used to be in the shoes of the civil servant, deputy minister, first deputy minister. Now I am the president of a uh, uh, joint stock company. So I observe both you know, considerations. I'm not a politician, so it is easy for me to talk about the political spheres, you know. I'm not responsible for anything here. And I should tell you, of course, you are right, you are correct. So if we are speaking about investing into the infrastructure of railways, we are talking about the period of return up to 20, 25 years. You know, five governments can be changed in the regular things. So in the countries with the regular political processes, I suppose it is much either, easier you know, to take long-standing obligations, which possibly won't be the obligations of the person sitting next to me, but his you know, <laughs> successor and vice versa. But you know, if we are talking you know, seriously, then we should think that national programs accepted and signed after the discussions national-wide, should be the spine to develop these infrastructure projects, not other possibilities. Because planning, budget planning for only, say, three years or five years, this is not enough to develop the infrastructure. Impossible. Thank you very much. Um, I know, Peter, you would like to add? Yes. J j just to say, I, th I think it's essential to have, uh, for, for public authorities to have a plan that is more than an annual plan. An annual plan means that you never start big projects. Um, you do need a plan, a multi-year plan. That doesn't mean that all of them have to be funded for their entire lives when they start, but actually a, a, a multi-year plan gives some confidence of, the, of sufficient funding to be able to, to, to start an, an, a, a big project. And like my colleague for the Netherlands, I, I think once you've started a big project, you never see it stopped. Uh, quite so. Um, 
I think the other thing to say is that, is that actually private investment in infrastructure projects is obviously uh, necessary and welcome in the modern, modern world, but uh, a number of the other speakers have said you do need to identify risk properly. Uh, both the public authority whose project it is needs to identify that and the private sector partners need to be able to assume it and they need to be people who are suitable um, to do so. We, we, we've had much more success in new construction projects from that purpose where actually uh, civil uh, uh, and other engineering companies are well able to understand what's, what's required uh, and, and uh, forward maintenance of that uh, can be affected by the design and indeed the materials than we have in projects designed to try to upgrade the uh, condition of uncertain and very ancient infrastructure. And of course, uh, the, the PPP experience in London was most unhappy um, and, and, and was in fact uh, a, a total failure because of the lack of um, identification of the real state of the assets, because the risks were taken by consortia who couldn't adequately divide them between them, uh, and frankly because the whole thing was, uh, was fundamentally a, a, merely a device to take, to take that uh, expenditure off the uh, public sector borrowing requirement. Um, thank you very much for that. I have a, a slight problem, um, as, uh, which is good because uh, you're a very interested audience. Uh, I still have uh, three hands up um, and um, uh, not that much time for it. So I would like to ask all three of you, A, to stand up um, and just pose the question. Please don't make an intervention, just pose your question if possible. This gentleman, I would do the kickoff, then you and then that's you. Thank you very much. And we'll have them one after the other. No, no, the gentleman behind you will start off with his question, then it's you. Yeah. First of all, the one behind you. Yeah, hello. Is it working? Yeah. Um, there is a lot of discussion about city developments, which um, have uh, taken most of the discussion. Um, one thing that has been singled out, I see, is that uh, Mr. Yakunin is the only one who have uh, posed the uh, question of multinational connections. Um, along also with the multi-generational connections um, where um, uh, people in government um, follow each other on the same path uh, on a proje projects that uh, go for 20 to 30 years. So um, shouldn't the multinational connection be primary to city connections um, since this is an international forum? Thank you very much uh, for that question. Uh, the next uh, person to pose the question is the gentleman who had already been standing up. Thank you very much. My name is Will Botman of the Dutch Mobility Users Association. Um, I have heard a lot of discussion about investment in uh, public transport and rail. Uh, if we look at the present uh, modal uh, division, so to say, uh, where passenger transport, at least in Europe, is for 80% uh, on the road, 10% uh, by public transport and 10% walking and cycling, uh, in, the growth of uh, demand for mobility will probably not be uh, able to be catered completely by public transport and rail. Uh, but at least if we look at cities, I think we need uh, seamless connections between road passenger road transport and, and public transport or rail transport. So I'm curious to know what kind of initiatives are taken on in that field. Thank you very much for that question. And the last question uh, in this uh, panel discussion is from you, yeah. sir. Uh, Yoshi Hayashi from uh, World Conference and Transport Research Society. I would like to raise a, a question on, uh, say, uh, decision-making friendly uh, system for the operators and also for the users. The first one for operators is uh, uh, in, in UK, uh, railways have been privatized uh, uh, truck and uh, operation. Uh, vertical separations, while Japan has uh, divided regionally in each region, uh, truck and operate, uh, rolling stocks operations are the same company. So uh, in my uh, opinion, uh, together, uh, putting together is much more efficient to decide everything. That is one thing. The second one is for users. Uh, again, uh, I, I'm not. Uh, I don't. I don't say I don't like uh, UK. But uh, in London, 
a fair system of uh, public transport so complicated and segregated the market. So people who use uh, uh, urban transport doesn't uh, consider for one day, but they have to decide just now. So it's uh, different from air transport uh, segregation of markets. So simple fares would be much better. So that is, again, a uh, decision-making friendly system. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Now we'll do a, uh, a quickie uh, on the answers. Um, uh, who wants to take the uh, multinational aspect? And I've, I've heard you uh, already sort of mumble uh, the problems are the same. <laughs> no, I've made points that we don't have that problem. If we want to go across borders, we get wet. <laughs> <laughs> Multinational, yes, I mean, you know. We, we invest, uh, Holland is, is very small, uh, so we have about 100 kilometers a year abroad. And we invested a lot of in uh, uh, rail tracks, ded even de dedicated rail tracks to Germany, uh, high-speed trains to Brussels and France, uh, two imported hubs, uh, airport, uh, Rotter Rotterdam uh, Harbour. So international connectivity is um, topic one in the Netherlands. Thank you very much. And just quickly to share from uh, straight away. Короткие комментарии по вопросам. Excuse me. Short comments on the questions, right? So firstly, this, this in uh, attempt to integrate the development of infrastructure already done. For example, UIC, if we are talking about railways, high-speed train, EU program, that is already there. But what is essential it should not be just political declaration, but it should be, you know, the uh, coordinated plan to develop different parts of the railways, say, in Europe, and promote the, you know, actual access to these uh, systems. It is not the case nowadays, because, you know, one of the very top uh, level uh, bureaucrats in EU told me that uh, actually, they have the right to start the case against all 27 members uh, of EU because that access is not provided yet. Speaking about, uh, you know, uh, the question concerning integration, disintegration, privatization, because we are going through this period now and we started greatly the experience of our colleagues from Great Britain. <coughs> I can refer only to the statement of uh, Prime Minister Cameron, who accepted that the decision of complete privatization of the entire railway system was a mistake. That was made publicly during his address uh, in the Institute of Civil Engineers in London, if I am not mistaken. And he stated that because of that, because of this mistake. Nowadays, the competitiveness of the British railways is below European railways, 40%. That is his statement. I'm just telling you. And being, you know, Russian, we are trying to keep integrated infrastructure, operation, safety, and locomotives in one system, integrated system. You know, so the models can be different. The result is of value. And, uh, you know, the judges are the people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Peter, London was addressed twice. Uh, it, it, it was. I, I would say <clears throat> I, I do operate a vertically, vertically integrated uh, urban railway. I think our experience with the uh, ill-fated uh, public-private partnership demonstrates that certainly, at least on metro systems, uh, vertical integration is essential um, because of the brief periods of time you have to maintain the infrastructure. Um, uh, are fares complicated in London? Uh, well, I suppose they might be. At least you can do it with one ticket, uh, which is what, what, what we think is important. Um, but that, that, that could be the subject of a, of a seminar in itself because we're trying to transport people over quite large areas of relatively low-density 
uh, uh, urban area which is as large as some small countries are. And, it's, and it seems to me to be inconceivable in, 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 in a time when actually there's a huge pressure on public funds to establish a fair system which would reward people who travel very long distances at peak times with the same fares, simple fares, as those who travel one or two miles. Uh, having said that, we only have one bus fare, but it took us a long time to get there. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. I, I know that most of you could continue this discussion. Um, I think um, we would have a couple of more people walking out. So I think um, uh, I stuck to my 10 minutes uh, over time since we started. I would love to thank uh, my esteemed panel for sharing their views uh, and uh, some of the problems, some of the solutions uh, that they found with us. Um, none of the solutions uh, that have, found, uh, have been found in one place will be uh, adopted in another place place one on one, uh, but I'm very sure that some of the essential solutions uh, can be uh, used uh, somewhere else, and I think that's part and parcel of uh, the International Transport Forum. We hope that you, ladies and gentlemen, uh, will face uh, your challenges, your transport challenges uh, with uh, bravado and uh, with a lot of energy, and uh, what we haven't mentioned, of course, is that transport is only one of the three aspects uh, that we need uh, in order to keep the transport systems going. We we need the IT and we need energy. And um, in order to get the energy, ladies and gentlemen, I think we all need a bit of lunch. Uh, so enjoy your personal energy. And we hope um, that uh, some of the solutions that we have found uh, will actually be in, uh, implemented very soon. Thank you very much.